and welcome to One Step Beyond, a show that encourages you to take a step outside your comfort zone and enrich your life. This is episode 18, the first show of 2021, and whenever you might be listening to this, I want to wish you a happy new year, in the hope that, a long winter notwithstanding, we will find ourselves in a better place as a human race at some point during its progress. Accordingly, I've titled this episode New Beginnings, and it's the first of a two-parter about two people who refused to let the pandemic of 2020 stop them from fulfilling their plan for major personal life changes. One of these guests I've never met before, though he works in very similar areas to myself, and the other I have known since the day he was born. I hope you'll gain some encouragement from their adventures over these last few months, because as one of them says, purposefully apportioning an old cliché to the horror show of our now thankfully rear mirror-viewed Covid year, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. And as the other one demonstrates by his actions, there's nothing like a pandemic to bring home the importance of making a difference with your life. Even if it does mean turning your back on a well-paid job in a touring tribute act. So who is this I of which you hear? Well, it's me, Tony Fletcher. And One Step Beyond is largely a hobby. I managed to eke out a living mainly through writing and other activities in media and music. In fact, and I don't believe I've told this story before, I came to produce One Step Beyond after a similar venture with the band The Pixies and their It's a Pixies podcast, on which we documented the making of their last album, Beneath the Eerie, recorded in my local Woodstock area, and for which I was thrust beyond my anticipated role as narrator and writer and fly on the wall, into an additional responsibility as producer. I discovered by putting that show together from the hundreds of hours of tapes we amassed that A, I could do it, that it was similar to much of my writing work in terms of connecting interview quotes through narrative, and b, that I really liked it, and that it was nice to take a break from the solitude of writing and do something a little more interactive. That said, I'm still feeling my way, allowing the creative wind to blow the show in whatever direction feels appropriate for the story at hand. Initially then, I was planning to condense these two interviews about new beginnings into the one show, given their similarities and themes, but I ultimately decided against it. Partly because it was going to be a lot of editing for the one episode, and I really do not want this show to go above the one hour mark. So, for the first time since One Step Beyond launched with the four-part from Kingston to Kilimanjaro documentary that was already in the can, I'm going to follow this episode up in just a week's time, with the second of the two interviews. And if you're lucky, you'll get another show with a new theme following just a week behind that. Who are these two guests and what do they bring to the show? Well, one of them is David Watts Barton, a writer, musician, burner and traveller who's getting on in his years, though I can assure you he doesn't look it, and which hasn't stopped him anyway from embracing a major lifestyle change by moving countries and continents in the middle of the pandemic. The other guest is considerably younger than me. His name is Adam Fletcher. He's also been through a significant life change of late. And if that last name has you wondering about any personal connections, Well, why don't we get down to it? Both interviews were recorded on New Year's Eve over some considerable time differences that brought us close to what might want to have been considered party hour at my guest's end in Europe, if parties were happening this year, that is. As such, you may hear a little bit of noise in Adam's background, uh, but when you hear his scenario, I'm sure you'll be very, very understanding. You're also going to hear some horrible compression on my end I used some new software for this show. Turns out to have been a bit of a disaster. I'm going to go back to Zoom from here on in. That may not make it the very best time for me to tell you that. As part of the new beginnings, I'm setting up a tip jar. As well as the ongoing monthly costs for the editing production software, then uh, due to the fact that Radio Kingston has currently closed its studios again due to understandable COVID concerns, I invested over the holidays in a hopefully high-end sure microphone, along with one of those newfangled boom stands that attaches to your desk. In short, this show is not produced for free, and it does take a lot of time. You should be able to see the supporter link on your app or webpage where you're listening to this, but if you can't and you want to just uh, chip in, then go to supporter.acast.com backslash one step beyond, all lowercase and all one word. 
your support is greatly appreciated. And with that, whether you're listening to this while running, cycling, hiking, walking, swimming or skiing or climbing, yes, I've listened to music and headphones during all these activities and more, or whether you're driving, passengering, training, coaching, busing, cooking, cocktailing, mocktailing, or just plain old lounging around, join us as we prepare to go. One step beyond! All right, welcome Adam Fletcher to One Step Beyond. And often people say, yes, yeah, same name, no relation. Well, in this case, you are a relation. You're, you're my nephew. Uh, after 20 odd episodes, I don't think anybody can accuse me of nepotism as much as anything. You lead a pretty interesting life and I don't get to see much of you at the best of times. And COVID has not been the best of times. How the hell are you, sir? And where do I find you? Uh, I'm currently living on the island of Samos, uh, which is a small island. It's about the same size of the as the Isle of Wight for any uh, British people out there. Um, and it's just off the coast of Turkey. So still technically part of Greece, but very, very close to Turkey. Like so close you can see Turkey, I believe. Oh, I mean, you can, you can, I mean, the first time I came here, I remember standing on the beach and somebody pointing out that that was Turkey across the water. And I literally just thought the island was curving round or I was in like the edge of a bay or something. But no, I mean, it's, it's a swimmable distance and several people have swum it. <laughs> Why are you on the island of Samos or Samos? Since 2015, uh, which I guess is really the pinnacle or what we think of as the pinnacle of the refugee crisis, um, Samos has been one of the main entry points to Europe uh, for those um, who are fleeing. Mostly people here from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, and places like uh, Congo, Democratic, uh, yeah, sorry, Democratic Republic of Congo, Cameroon, um, places like that and so it's one of the main stops for people who go through Turkey it's one of the basically the kind of safest crossings into Europe um, because of its proximity um, but then because of that it also means that the uh, the makeshift um, you can't see but I'm making uh, <laughs> air quotes with my fingers the uh, supposedly temporary camp that was set up in 2016 and that was built for 600 people and it now has over 4,000. And at one point when I was here last year, we had over 6,000. So this is my my fourth year coming to Samos. I've been here every summer uh, before that. Uh, but the times I've been here before, I've been working as like, uh, I've been working as a music teacher, an English teacher, and like a coordinator of children's activities. Um, so yeah, that's basically why I'm here. I volunteer for one of the NGOs that specializes in primary medical care. I was uh, trying to read up on Samos before having this interview and, you know, there are different ways to go. And one of them is to go on sort of touristy websites and Samos looks like just this idyllic Greek island in the Aegean Sea. Is there a world of tourism that exists on this island beyond the camps that you're working with? Well, there you probably hit the exact, uh, you really, really hit the nail on the head in terms of tensions between uh, with the camp open and the locals on the island. It's so easy on this island for the divide between refugees and NGOs and locals. The divide can just be enormous. And that really comes from the idea of tourism and this idea that the decline in tourism is due to the opening of the camps. So prior to 2015, you're right, Samos is actually was quite, a, I mean, not so much a well-known tourist spot for, for English people, but particularly uh, for Germans um, and Dutch tourists. And yeah, that, that really did take, it took quite a huge impact um, after 2015, 2016, because, you know, people coming for a holiday don't really want to think about the, the, the other side and the reality of what the EU's migrant policies uh, engenders. And, I, I think people obviously don't want to think about that. So um, tourism does still exist, at least pre-COVID, um, but it took a huge hit after 2015 and hasn't properly recovered since. Um, and I think that's at the root of a lot of tension between locals and, and refugees. To help us all better understand the situation on Samos, I'm going to put a link in the show notes to an article from the New York Times dated February 2020, just before the pandemic hit. It speaks specifically about the tensions of which Adam notes there between locals and refugees. 
and it says the following as part of a proper long story about the situation there. Quote, about 6,800 asylum seekers are jammed into the camp and fighting the elements in the olive groves and pine woods of the hill. Below is a quaint port town that is home to about 6,200 locals. Together, the locals and asylum seekers bear the shared brunt of forces beyond their control. Greek government dysfunction, the cold shoulder of the European Union, the chaos in the Middle East and the geopolitical calculations of Turkey. Unfortunately, people can be uh, led by their leaders to say, well, your problem is not my problem. Sort it out in your own country. And I'd like to give you a chance to just explain what people are trying to flee from, uh, from these, this multitude of countries. And to what extent, if they're coming to the EU uh, or seeking to come to the EU, the EU has a responsibility to uh, take them on and take, take them in. Yeah, so if someone was to ask me what the situations people are specifically fleeing from, from their home countries... Not only would it depend person to person, country to country, but also I'm sure if you were to go look on the UNHCR website or you were to do any of your own sort of research, as, I'm, as you've done, Tony, this week, any of your listeners, they'll be able to find more accurate facts about the sociopolitical dangers and issues that people are facing that have made them, led them to a situation where they're not safe and they're in quite severe danger in their own country. So that, that sort of thing... You, you can research on a grand scale, and if that's something you're interested in, I'd advise you to do that. But if you want to ask per, on a more personal level as to why someone, you know, what, what stories am I hearing here and why people are making this journey, even though I'm hearing the whole run, like the, the run of the gamut of different stories of why people are here, the thing that links all of them is the fact that I think when I first got here was to see that the conditions that people were having to live in and then when I added that on to the stories that people told me of their journey and not only the, the dangers that we hear about constantly and the shocking number of people who drown in the Aegean and Mediterranean every year, which is, is still, I mean, I personally think a bit of a disgrace for the EU to be beholding. Um, it's just the sheer length of journey that people have been, they've, they've left their countries five or six years ago and they're only now still waiting in Samos in these horrific conditions. And I think the thing that clicked with me the first time I was here was just to understand, you, you know what? N no one would do this if they had any other choice. There is no reason you would put yourself in this position after six years and then to be living in, in these really, really debilitating, horrifying conditions. No, no one would do that unless they, they didn't have a choice and were fleeing from something that put them in severe danger. And I think that is just something that's very... It might be hard to intuitively get and, until you see it firsthand, but I think once you see it firsthand, this idea that someone would come for any just for, you know, just because they think it's a, for better economic reasons or for any of the stuff that, that a lot of conservative media throw out, I just think is laughable. Um, but the, the one thing I'd want to finish it with uh, as well is that, uh, yeah, the, another thing that really drove it home to me was I, I used to work with a volunteer from Iran at Samos Volunteers. Um, and he's this absolutely wonderful man. His story was, it was quite complicated and very individual, but when he was in his asylum interview, he said that they asked him, you know, why do you want to live in Europe? And his response was, I don't want to live in Europe. I want to live in Iran. Like, if you can send me back to Iran and make it so that I am safe and that I don't have to fear for my life, then send me back. That's where my family are. That's where my friends are. That's where my home is. That's where everyone I've known and loved and my culture is. Like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be in a strange country where I can't speak the language. Like, but, but I, you know, you can't do that. I know you can't do that. So if you ever can, brilliant, I will go back. But until then, I'm here asking for just basic shelter and the, the right to live without fear. And yeah, I just thought that was a really, a really interesting way of looking at it. You, you know, you start looking at the history of the world, you realize it's one endless story of migration. And to pretend that the borders that we currently have are permanent is utterly laughable. I mean, you know, the Greeks had an empire, the Turks had an empire, the British had an empire. And, the you know, the idea that that border, you know, if you're a kilometer or two kilometers from Turkey, and yet this is somehow a Greek island, you know, all these, so many of these borders are false. And, it, and it's what countries do to each other often creates the conditions that, you know, a general generation or two down the line cre creates those conditions where people have to flee. So we're all kind of connected and partly responsible 
for what else is going on on the planet, right? Uh, I think you, you said it perfectly in terms of the idea that the the geopolitical landscape of, of northern Africa and uh, the Middle East and Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, this idea that this whole political and uh, landscape has nothing to do with any history of colonization or any history of of European and, and Middle Eastern and American relations is just completely laughable. Yeah, it just smacks of trying to wash your hands of something that is not convenient to you. While there are many sources for which you can find out the kind of reasons that people feel the need to flee their home countries, I'm going to also just point you to the International Rescue Committee that does a lot of work on the ground on the Greek islands. They have a page entitled What Caused the Crisis in Greece? And they describe Greece as a holding pen for people seeking asylum, saying, This is not a humanitarian crisis, but a political one. The European Union was founded on a commitment to international law and human rights that has driven policies for 60 years. Recently, however, the EU adopted border restrictions and other edicts that have prevented people seeking sanctuary from entering Europe, putting the world's most vulnerable increasingly at risk. The EU's policies also mean that Greece, along with Italy, is being asked to shoulder much of the responsibility for the lives of those who have reached Europe in search of safety. And then to add from my end that the inevitable upshot of all this is that the longer these asylum seekers remain in makeshift camps, the more degrading become their living conditions. I found myself uh, over at a, a site called Sam Samos Volunteers, Dot org, And uh, I'm, I'm going to read a little bit about how they summarize the conditions. And this does appear to be up to date, by the way, from what I could tell. It says, finding shelter is a struggle. In the camp itself, people sleep in dangerously overfilled containers. Most, however, are forced to set up tents or build a shelter in the unofficial, quote, jungle, which doesn't exist on paper, but may house as many as 4,000 people. That might have been at the peak, I guess. Uh, in summer, there's hardly any shade to provide a cool space. During the wet, cold and stormy winter, tents provide, tents provide inadequate protection against the elements, leaving many vulnerable to infections. The high winds coming from the sea tear down flimsy tents and spread rubbish and waste. And then it actually goes on. It gets worse. It's a sanitation and health care provision, especially mental health care, is absolutely insufficient. Um, in such an overcrowded space, parasites such as bedbugs and scabies are rampant and the camp has rats, snakes and scorpions living amongst the dirt. There are hardly any toilets and showers, and most of them are broken. Thousands of the world's most vulnerable people have access to only one doctor, one psychologist, and a seriously overwhelmed local hospital. People are provided with camp food for which they have to queue for hours, which is low in nutrients. Is that a relatively accurate description of the conditions that people are in? Oh, I mean, entirely. Um, and you know, I've been here now since August, um, and I can hear right now how hard it's raining outside. Uh, but in the, the island really is the, the difference between summer and winter is, is quite enormous. And I think just when you're reading that, then talking about the fact that when you're here in the summer, it's so brutally hot every day. And the fact that when it gets to the winter, you have the complete opposite problem as in how the hell is a tent going to survive for continuous days of rain, which is really not uncommon on the island. Um, and actually only last week, um, a Dutch charity called Movement on the Ground um, did a tarp distribution um, uh, of just basically rainproof tarps to cover everyone's tents. But I mean, the sheer level of organization that had to go into it between about five different organizations um, and then the, a lot of the people, uh, community volunteers who work with us, um, even just getting them tickets to be able to get this tarp. Because obviously, if you are handing out something that essential to people and you have to get it to 4,000 people fairly, you have to try and do it in a way which is not only fair, but also doesn't lead to any sort of panic or any sort of... Because, it's a, I mean, obviously, it's such a desperate situation. It's um, so, so to be like, even just the sheer level of organization that had to go into giving something as basic as just a rainproof tarp to cover the tent was kind of... Yeah, uh, I was, I, I don't know. it was quite an eye opener for me. So uh, not only are all the things that you just mentioned uh, accurate and actually Samos Volunteers is, is the is the NGO I've worked for the past three years. Um, so uh, not only is it accurate, but e even just trying to improve any of those provisions just a tiny bit can often just literally feel like pushing an enormous <laughs> boulder uphill. If you've ever wondered about the origins of that expression, it actually hails from a Greek myth that of Sisyphus, 
who angered the great god Zeus and was condemned to forever roll a rock up a hill. Although there is a variation on that theme, where when you get to the top, the rock promptly rolls down the other side and you have to start again. It occurs to me that this is the third episode of One Step Beyond to touch on Greek legends and mythology, following on from the If Not Now When episode about the Brit who ran in Pheidippides' footsteps from Sparta to Marathon, and the more recent one about minimal hiking, entitled Who Was Diogenes and Why Should We Care? And if you might be asking why we should care about Samos, it's worth noting that the island is actually host to the Temple of Hera, the Greek goddess who was married to Zeus. The temple is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, I'll have you know. And that the island is also the proven birthplace, both of Pythagoras, who gave us the mathematical equation Pi, and Epicurus, who gave us the word Epicurean for a foodie. We'll return to the contemporary situation on the ground in Samos in a moment but this seems like a suitable time to find out about Adam's personal journey and how his involvement on the island these last four years has caused him to reevaluate his own career. I did call this episode New Beginnings, after all. This is part of a bigger personal life story for you. You've taken a further step. Talk us through it. Uh, As I said earlier on the podcast, I'm I'm 31 years old. Uh, And it's very interesting when this pandemic hit on a personal level for me, um, because about four months previous to that, I had started to make quite a drastic career change in my life. Um, and that process is still going on. And uh, for it to be happening during this year is quite something. I have quite a few friends who are saying like, oh, you know, this year, everything just stays the same. It's very static, very stale. And to me, it's, it's not been that experience. It's actually been a, a year of quite a lot of uh, uh, personal change in the face of uh a global situation that's asking you to stay still. Um, so from the age of 18, um, I s- studied music uh, and I've been working as a musician uh, from then until now, really, uh, until the start of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, but yeah, that, that career really spanned a, a lot of different things uh, from my sort of early 20s of just doing music that I really loved and cared about and playing in bands where we earned n- no money and we toured through Europe for about three weeks, sleeping on people's couches and crammed into one hotel room um, to later parts of my career where uh, I <laughs> basically played for a German ABBA tribute show, which was <laughs> quite a, a, a financially rewarding experience, uh, if not necessarily a musically creatively rewarding one. Although there were definitely some, some enjoyable times. Uh, it was quite fun, quite fun to do something uh, definitely outside of my own personal comfort zone. My understanding, I don't think you were a professional Agnetha or, or Anifried, uh, which you were, you were a professional what, Benny or Bjorn? Uh, Benny, Benny Anderson. Right, the keyboard player, correct? The keyboard player, that's correct. The right. So you were actually working for a, 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 you know, a professional outfit for which you, I guess you were hired and you went on tours and I know you're a great pianist and, and I guess that's what you did for a while. Uh, yeah. For, for, I think from about 2016, that's what I did. Uh, uh, basically about two months every year. So from like January, February each year. Um, I mean, just the, the sheer scale of it was, was quite hilarious. I'm just going to try and throw out some numbers to kind of make it clear how weirdly popular tribute shows are in Germany and the Netherlands and Austria, because some of the shows would have over 2,000 people there. And I'm thinking, 2,000 people have come and paid like 50, 60 euros each to come see an Abbott Abbe tribute show. This is just, it just exists on such a scale in mainland Europe compared, I think, to the UK and the US. I guess you had to put on a wig and a white suit. I did, I did. Oh, I did. So is there a degree of <laughs> is there a degree of acting involved in that as well? Do you have to kind of like become become Benny as opposed to being Adam Fletcher playing an ABBA song for, for one night? Yeah, I mean I can't do a Swedish accent. So the uh, the girls in the show were just so incredibly talented. Uh, and for them to like sing and dance in enormous heels for two and a half hours every night. I mean, I was tired after two and a half hours every night of playing the piano. Um, but you know, the most I had to do is occasionally dance a little bit and, oh, it was a grand piano that span on its axis. So you could do a little spin, um, which is quite ridiculous. Um, I want one of those those in my front room. (laughs) 
<laughs> I don't, there isn't room for it, actually. I don't know why I said that. There's absolutely no room for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, they would do Swedish accents and they would do proper acting, but they're also, you know, fantastic actors, the two of them. Whereas for me, I tried to do a Swedish accent the first night I did it and went, nope, I'm just going to speak in my English accent and they'll just have to be fine with it. <laughs> you, you, you know, we could go into uh, the fact you could always learn a Swedish accent from your dad, who's been living in Sweden for the last number of number of years. So so I, I don't know. I don't know if your heart was in this, Adam, evidently. So, so I do understand that if you're, particularly if you're a, mu a musician and got any kind of uh, real, you know, care about what you do, this is this was probably not this was probably something you could have carried on doing for a number of more years, but not something you wanted to do. But this life change, what is it you actually decided to do this past year? Yeah, I think once it got to about the uh, last summer, so summer 2019, um, I had basically got to this point where, although I was involved in a lot of projects that I really loved and cared about. Um, I write music for a lot of theater in London and write a lot of my own music. I've, and I work with like a, a couple of drag companies as well, which I really enjoy. And all of, I just realized all of this stuff that I really loved in music that I really cared about was all the stuff I was doing for free. And I've always made sure that my entire music career to only spend half of my time doing stuff that pays me because stuff that pays me is barely ever interesting. And I remember thinking, why am I spending half of my life doing this stuff that's, that's, that's supposed to be like musically fulfilling and people assume it is because it's music, but when it's not really what you want to do, it's kind of like any other job. And I think my experiences over the last few years volunteering here every summer just made me think, you know what, I kind of, I kind of feel like I can, I can do more. I can challenge myself in a different way while still keeping the aspects of music that I care about. And then, um, so I kind of thought about it and thought like, what, you know, what things do I think I would be interested in? I decided I wanted to do medicine, but I really had no idea at each stage if that was something that was going to be feasible. And then over this last year and a half, it just, I've kind of just slowly overcome more and more obstacles toward it um, to the point where now I'm working full time for a, a medical NGO here in Greece. And I'm about two weeks away from my medical school interviews in the UK. So Right now, it feels like the very, I feel like I'm at the end of a long process, but actually if I get in, it will just be the start of a very long process. Well, sure. And most people are, uh, are uh, turned off from the idea of making these kind of changes, because especially if they've been like you and gone through college in the first place, and I think you have a music degree. Am I right? You do have a music degree? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so once they've done that, it's like, wow, that was enough college. You know, I'd better use this degree. And then you, you know, find your way in life and you earn your money and you go down, down that path. And as I'm finding out and as I'm talking about with this show, there's no one age that you can make a change. It's about the desire to make a change. But certainly the prospect of how long would this take you to get this degree so that you can actually be a, a, a doctor as opposed to just a volunteer um, in this situation? So... Um... Uh, normally in the UK, um, and again, for American listeners, uh, you don't have to do like a, a, a studying medicine in the UK is not just a graduate course. It's actually primarily an undergraduate course. So you do it right from when you start university. And uh, normally it's a five year course, which uh, leaves you to be qualified with the uh, general body of medicine. Um, after which you'd start working in a hospital. You still have several foundation years still to go which I think they call interning in America. Um, but you would actually be getting paid at that point. So actually, in terms of the training, to in terms of being qualified in whatever, you, whatever specialty you choose, I mean, that can go on 10 plus years before you're not considered a junior doctor anymore. But in terms of actual qualifying um, to and qualifying and getting a job within the NHS, it's a five year, five years until you reach that point in your training. And for me, because I already have a degree, it would be one year less. So I would have four years before I would be um, hired by the NHS. Right. So that is a big change. I mean, it's one thing at 18 to say, oh, I'm going to go off to college for three or four years and have fun. And this is like the golden years of my, my youth. It's another thing at the age of 30 to say, all right, I'm going to spend the next four years going back to back to college because that's an I mean that's the age I settled down and had kids so the, the, the age to go back to college because I've decided that that music degree I got you know some wonderful things but it's it's not taking me where I actually want to go with my life yeah it's really interesting uh, and I remember who it was who said it to me it's a good friend of mine called Lewis Daniel who's a fantastic musician I advise anyone to check out um, amazing amazing saxophonist uh, but he often just has these words of wisdom. And one time he said something to me where he was like, he was like, Adam, people always say that life is short, but 
actually that's 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 not right life's actually really long life actually goes on for ages like there's a whole lot of days and hours to fill and actually you might as well spend them doing what you want to do with them and i think there's two things that comes out of that it's a yeah you might as well spend it doing what you want to do like i think it's better to put in some some extra inconvenience in the short term because actually hopefully you've still got another 30 or 40 years of your of your career to think about um, but also it just shows that no one has to just be one thing. Like you don't have to be everything you want to be in your life straight away. I think for me, it's been, if I do manage to get in, it's the thought of being allowed to have a, a musical career for 12 years and then a medical career for the next 30 just feels like such a, I just feel very blessed if that, if that, if that's an option, because it's just the idea that you don't just have to have one career. You actually do have the time in your life to, to explore different things and actually, challenge yourself to maybe yeah to, to maybe there's 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 more you can contribute in a different way than you maybe previously thought you were capable of i've got a few things to ask you before we're going to have to wrap wrap this up one of them is you know what is life like for for you as volunteers in in uh, on samos there i mean you know it's new year's eve tonight do you have do you have your own you know you're not living in the camp in that kind of awful conditions do you do you have a decent life there yourselves and it's so strange the first time you come here to be working with people who live in very difficult conditions, but to also experience so much positivity and an attitude of, of joy and friendliness and friendship. And I've had several people I've worked with or students I used to teach where, you know, they tell me about a situation they were going through and I'd be like, I'm so sorry. Um, and they'd be like, no, 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 I don't want you to be sorry. Come on, positivity. We're here. We're alive. Let's do it. And I think, that's the, that's the real thing that it's kind of hard to prepare yourself for, that actually you're in a situation which is very upsetting, but actually people really do want some positivity and some normalcy and some friendships and relationships. And it's also just a really rewarding experience in terms of there is actually a, a lot of positivity and empowerment that actually comes from working as part of a team that's making a very, albeit a very small difference in the grand scheme of things, um, but a difference nonetheless, it can actually be quite a, an, an empowering feeling. So um, I think really our lives are, are, are quite privileged and I think we're quite good at, at recognizing that out here. Yeah, good for you. How has COVID affected the camp in terms of infections for one thing and any risks that you face um, for yourself? And related to that, how has it affected the impact of charities on the ground? Uh, up until about September this year, there was only three cases reported in total on the island. So the island had largely waltzed through the pandemic unscathed until uh, September this year uh, when the first cases started arriving. And actually, the first cases did arrive through our clinic, um, through patients we saw at our clinic. I mean, obviously, it didn't arrive from people at the camp. It must have arrived from people arriving by plane. Um, but... Uh, yeah, during September, the cases did start to rise, particularly in the camp. Um, although this was, I would say, largely because the police started imposing a lockdown on the camp and not on the rest of the town, um, which meant that uh, a lockdown only works if you're three or four people in a house locked down or one person in a house. It doesn't work if you're 4,000 people locked down. It just makes it spread even worse. Um, so we did have a large amount of infections and the the repercussions of that were... were not dire in a health context, but really dire, I think, in the psychosocial, psychosocial needs of people here. So there's a large number of organizations such as Samos Volunteers um, or Still I Rise, who run like a, a secondary school for kids. Um, uh, what else? A Banana House is an uh, and, uh, adult education center. The Nest is like a child care. Um, we Are One is a women's center. All of these amazing organizations who suddenly couldn't open. And I'm really sad to say that even right now, it's still the same. Uh, the case is still the same. So we at MedEqualy team are open. Uh, Doctors Without Borders team here are open. Um, but almost all of the other NGOs are currently not operating because they have no legal basis to do so under the Greek lockdown. So, um, But on the positive side of it, there currently hasn't been any reported cases of coronavirus on the island for the past few weeks. So in terms of that, we are very lucky. Just as I was finishing off this show, literally about to mix it down, Adam sent me a WhatsApp message clarifying a couple of things I'd asked him about. 
So there are people like himself, about half the Medicola team, live in rented houses. They pay their own rent to be there, but it's a very, very low rent secured by the NGO. The other half of the team, most of them interpreters, are members of the camp. So we're talking here about people, they're refugees, but they are also working as interpreters for their own communities. They live in the camp and Adam says that right now he and other volunteers are spending a lot of time trying to help them rebuild their tents uh, due to the endless rainstorms. And in doing more of my own research, I realized that the Greek government had uh, had announced that it would close the camp on Samos by the end of 2020. Of course, with COVID, that hasn't happened. But Adam did elaborate on the plan. And apparently the Greek government is looking to build a separate camp in the middle of the island uh, to house 3,000 people. And while there would be some benefits from that, Adam says that on the island of Lesvos, which has had the most publicity, I guess because it's had the most um, asylum seekers, uh, the new camp that was built there, he says, really has more of the feelings of a prison. So that these poor people seeking asylum are ending up in a kind of perpetual purgatory. All of which really indicates that this is an issue that we can't afford to let slip from our radars. So if people listening to this um, you know, want to focus on and they, they're, they're hearing your story and the, the, the things that I've been reading out and want to help, what's the best way that they could actually help? So I think the, my, my main advice for people would be to A, do some research. Um, but also to try and look at not only organizations that they think provide something that they think is important personally, because often a lot of the thing, I mean, medicine is obviously incredibly important, um, but because of the fact that it's so universally considered important, um, medical team, we do have a, a relatively steady stream of funding and we have a lot of different other larger NGOs who contribute to us, um, which is great. But sometimes some of the smaller organizations um, don't have that same level of support. And if they offer things such as, um, you know, a women's center, not all, it's not as universally recognized. Anything that's psychosocial in that sense often doesn't get as universally recognized as being vitally important for people. So I'd advise people to kind of look for something that they think represents a need that they feel strongly about. Uh, and also maybe to focus on organizations that seem like they're more fledgling uh, where actually I would say your support might be more directly useful. Um, and when in doubt, just, you know, especially with a smaller organization, just contact them. Almost all of them have emails where you can contact and say, hey, I'd like to contribute to something. Do you have anything that would be that you need uh, any financial support for any projects that are upcoming? Um, and I think most, most of the time they'd be more than happy to communicate about it. But the main thing I would say, to be honest, especially anyone, anyone listening from America or from the UK is... Um, is to understand that actually you have something to contribute. And if you have four weeks of your time, uh, you know, they, uh, we have met people here teaching every language imaginable. We've had people teaching music, teaching dance, um, teaching yoga, running exercise classes, running cooking classes, sewing classes, um, uh, people running sports events, kids activities. There was a circus here once. There was, I mean, actually everything you could possibly think of. Uh, or maybe you're a medic, or maybe you are a professional educator, um, or maybe also maybe you work in the legal sector. There are so many organizations here where all you, it doesn't cost you anything to do it. All you have to do is book a flight, come somewhere for four weeks, and it's an, I think, if anything, it's an interesting experience to, to kind of challenge yourself in a new context. So I'd say to everyone... You know, if they think they have that time in their life that they think that might, I, I don't know, it's, it's something that can be really interesting to experience and change your horizons on the world and actually really make, show, kind of show how empowering it is that you can actually make a difference, even if it's a small one. We could certainly end this feature there, but I'm going to do so instead by bringing it back around to the reason that Adam is on the island of Samos to begin with. I mentioned earlier the organisation Samos Volunteers. On their Instagram page, they feature the results of an essay competition they ran recently. And I'd like to quote from the award-winning contribution in the medium to hard category, yes, there was more than one category, by Shakiba, a 15-year-old from Afghanistan. 
It fills 5 IG frames, but it ends as follows. I just want the world to please understand refugees, she writes. No one comes here for enjoyment. If we didn't have problems, we wouldn't come. We are not guilty. We are not animals. We are human, like you. Please salvage us from this jungle. You can learn more about the situation on the island of Samos and the other Greek islands by reading the articles linked in the show notes or, of course, by doing more of your own research. You can also stay up to date with the situation right there in Samos by listening to the very short podcast put together once a month by Medequalitine. That's the NGO that Adam is volunteering for. He narrated a recent episode about the two fires that had taken place in the camps, which just further destroyed the lives of some of those refugees. Adam also supplied a pretty comprehensive list of the various NGOs and charities that do work on the island of Samos. And those two are in the show notes. I've never actually sat and watched him in his role as Benny from ABBA, but I did manage to secure from him the name of the tribute group. It's ABBA Gold, the concert show, and I'm sure there are YouTube clips out there if you care. Usually this is the point at which I bring you up to date on my own activities, particularly the outdoor ones, and there have been plenty. But I'm going to keep this one especially short and keep it with the family. 2020 was the first year of my life I didn't step foot in the UK. 2020 was also shaping up to be the first year I hadn't stepped foot in New York City since 1986 when I visited and fell in love with the place. And I actually decided I couldn't go through with that. So between Christmas and New Year, Along with my younger son, we did take a day trip down there. I was inspired by a couple of local people from up here, 100 miles north, who'd gone down to MoMA, Museum of Modern Art, and said that they had all that priceless art pretty much to themselves. Well, we did much the same thing. We didn't have the art entirely to ourselves. Uh, There were people there, but everybody was fully masked up. It was on timed tickets. And the fact that I could get mine at such short notice indicates that there's not a great demand to go to MoMA right now. We also had time to walk through Central Park, go into a couple of shops, and then especially, and this is the connection, go downtown to the financial district where Adam's older brother, my only other nephew, now lives. And I don't get to see him often enough either, especially, of course, during the pandemic time. He did take a trip up to see us when things were looking better in September. It was lovely to see him and his husband. And we sat out on the rooftop up there and had a wonderful view of the New York skyline, including Brooklyn, where my younger son was born. These are incredibly difficult times, and much as we were in two minds about visiting New York City, I genuinely felt all the better for doing so. I saw people going about their business, masked up, keeping a social distance, trying to be safe, but also trying to have a life. I was producing this show on Wednesday, January the 6th, And I got understandably distracted by items in the news, so I've ended up finishing it a morning later than usual. But with real relief knowing that two weeks from today, we will be in a different situation in this country. We'll have turned a political corner, if not necessarily a COVID one, but the former may well impact on the latter and help us get back to the lives we want to live sooner rather than later. One Step Beyond is written, produced and narrated by Tony Fletcher. Incidental music is by Noel Fletcher. The theme song is by Madness, used with permission, and the logo is by Mark Lerner. Special thanks to Radio Kingston for airing these episodes and for supplying studio space when not under lockdown. 
If you like what you hear, please hit the subscribe button and or leave a positive rating and or review. You can find us on social media. Just search One Step Beyond with Tony Fletcher and the show should come up on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. To subscribe to a newsletter, to reach out via email and especially if you're interested in sponsorship opportunities, email onestepbeyond at ijamming.net. That's I-J-A, M for mother, M for mother, I, N for Nancy, G dot net. One Step Beyond is available on just about every podcast platform known to man, and most likely a few that have yet to be discovered. It's hosted by Acast. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay active.